Thank you very much. The first person to respond and comment is the former chief of IDF General Star. Sorry, the former head of the Mossad, Major General in Retirement, Mayor Dagan. Good afternoon. First of all, I was very impressed, Amos, from your very impressive arguments. I don't agree with all of them, by the way. Some of them I do. I would like to start with the point that should be non noticed. We're all relating as if to the understanding of the NPT uh, Convention. Let's admit that the NPT Convention has been already for more than 15 years in a reality of uh, um, the uh, beginning of a collapse. It didn't start with Iran, it continued with Pakistan, India, North Korea. It came to a completely kind of maturity in Syria and a very problematic reality in Libya. And actually, we are coping with an issue that we put everything on the NPT, where the NPT itself, at this point of time, with the protocol, without the protocol, and we saw that countries can accept it and at a certain point to reject it actually without paying a real price for that. This creates a much more meaningful difficulty in the dialogue and the discussion about the Iranian issue. Just a few uh, words about models. Model has a uh, um, theoretical advantages, but it's not an alternative to thinking. It's got a tendency for abstraction and to bring extreme situation of uh, black and white and unfortunately reality, even the reality with Iran is not in the middle between black and white. It's uh, in many uh, gray uh, encounters, very problematic ones, and it doesn't uh, come into extreme and uh, in the expression that I really don't like so much, and that is a to be bombed or to bomb. I think there's an inner contradiction between these two words, as if the reality that if we don't do anything, they will reach a bomb, and the only way to prevent them from doing it is to bomb them. But it's really not true. Uh, the ways to prevent, and here I uh, agree with uh, Amos, there are other alternatives how to deal with the Iranian challenge, and I think that the reality is much more complex. And I think that we have to take into account we uh, cannot isolate the Iranian issue from regional issues. We cannot detach them from the inner situation in Israel. We cannot uh, detach them from the relationships that Israel has with the international community and especially with the states. And not to mention uh, the issues with our neighboring countries and uh, in the Iranian case, luckily, their interest and our interest is uh, are very mutual. Some points that I think are important to say. I accept some of the parts of the model and the strategy that Amos suggested. I would add a few elements, I think, and I'll mention them. I also will add that the containment and uh, accept uh, Amos is impossible with Iran. It's an uh, equation between things that are not connected to another, and Amos already answered, I think. Uh, he pinpoints a few things. It's uh, the lack of identity between the implications of the reality that was between the United States and the Soviet Union and between us and Iran. It doesn't go together. I am not disputing the determination that the Iranians are trying to reach a nuclear capability. I'm just saying, and I accept some of the things that Amos said, that they're not advancing running to the project. They're advancing very cautiously while uh, they are taking shortcuts and the final point of decision, we're still not there. 
In other words, a breakout to reach uh, military nuclear capability, and I think that's their target, no question. I'd like to touch upon a few points before I talk about the comprehensive strategy, if we talk about bombing or being bombed. We are creating a sort of equation that said that unless we bomb them, they are going to reach a bomb. And the question we have to ask, if we do bomb them, they won't have a bomb? I think that in a, 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 a organized uh, uh, process you come very quickly to the conclusion that the price of the attack will accelerate the Iranian project. And why? Because with our own hands, we are going to supply them with the legitimacy to reach a military uh, nuclear uh, capability. What did they say? They'll say, we uh, abided by the agreement with the IAEA and here we are attacked that according to foreign sources have strategic capability. Now we have no choice. We have to defend ourselves and in order to defend ourselves we have to reach strategic capabilities. And therefore at this time not only do we uh, satisfy them with uh, legitimation but we'll do something which is against the interest. Iran at the moment is in a very problematic process. Part of it because of the sanctions and some of it uh, not connected to the sanctions. Part of it has to do with the world crisis. Part of it has to do with the bad uh, management uh, which is in the Iranian police. Part of it has to do with the uh, uh, considerations and the preferences and the policies of the Islamic war targets. Part of it is the Iranian failure at the moment to become the dominant factor in the Shiite world. And here they really failed. Even Iraq, uh, that uh, where they succeed, one can say that the Shiite camp within Iraq not necessarily aligns with the Iranian positions. Uh, they have much more independent positions. And if we take uh, Sistani, uh, although he's Iranian and he's a leader of the Shia, I think the most known and the most accepted in Iran today, we see that he doesn't even accept the worldview of Khomeini, which was shaped uh, through El Fakir, namely the concentration of the leadership within a leader who is both religious and political. He disputes it. He's in a different kind of school. Khomeini was a religious innovator. He took some esoteric perception in the Shia, he put it in the center of the existence, and not necessarily it's accepted today by large parts of the uh, community. Not only did they not become the leaders of the Islamic world, but they find themselves uh, within an inner struggle within, within the Islamic world, which is reflected in a very extreme uh, polarity between between the uh, Sunnis and the Shiites. The economic situation is also very harsh. Uh, there's intolerable inflation. They have a massive uh, um, uh, renaissance of all the ethnic groups in Iran, each of its uh, with its own uh, considerations. Some part of the fact that they are prevented from uh, preserving their ethnic cultural identity, and some of them because of political considerations, and that creates a constant threat on the capability of the regime to enforce its wish within Iran itself. Within this reality, let's think what does an attack do? If I take the Iranians an example and we'll take the war between Iraq and Iran, when it broke out, all the Iranians uh, stood be behind their leadership with no exception. Even those military people who were definitely with a different perception, some of them were leftists, some of them were staunch supporters of the Shah, they put aside all the rivalries and all the discussions between them and they went to fight for the country. I think that if we attack today, not only do 
we not uh, delay the bomb what we will reach a reality whereby we are going to solve all the political inner problems and some of the economic problems by the fact that we will cause the entire Iranian population to stand all of them behind their leaders and I think that at this point of time in the reality that Iran is in uh, I think this is going to be a mistake by the way I agree with Amos that the military capability has to be there we always have to sort of uh, wave with it but when I look at Iran and I look and see whether the focusing of the military rationale vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear plan is this a risk for the existence of the regime the answer is no because uh, we are not directing towards something that threatens the regime on the contrary it's uh, going to create a reality where everybody of all the Iranians are going to stand behind their regime I think that this reality compels us to consider especially uh, this uh, military attack is not going to stop the project. A state like Iran that uh, creates uh, 100,000 students a year with the impressive capabilities in physics and chemistry and all the natural sciences when the technology is not innovative. I'll remind you all that the first bomb was uh, launched in August uh, 45 on Japan. We're talking about technologies of not uh, advanced uh, countries. Third world, they managed to reach this technology and the best proof that we have is North Korea. And let's uh, say the truth. Even Pakistan is not exactly one of the countries which is in the most advanced line of nations in the world, but this is a third world country that managed to concentrate all its efforts of the sources, strategy and capabilities, and it managed to get, uh, as a result of the fact that they took the nuclear capability as a response to the Indian challenge. And I think that in this reality, to argue that by bombing, we're going to stop the plan or the pro project, I think it's a very problematic argument. It has to be proven, especially uh, what Amos called uh, the uh, uh, that the reality doesn't end uh, with the attack. The reality ends with a process of a dialogue and consolidating. A, a comprehensive strategy that also deals with what happens a day after the attack. I don't uh, agree that discussions in this uh, questions were taken. What do we do the day after? Even this issue is very complex and very complicated because it depends on time and place and local challenges and regional and world reality. That's why there's a difficulty to plan it and to prepare to what we call uh, the next uh, stage of the war. It's much more complicated than what we know today. And therefore, uh, had I had to recommend uh, Amos uh, suggests, first of all, I think, to put a lot of political and economic pressure. And I think that we must put a threat to the regime as a central issue, something that really will impact the regime. And I'll give you an illustration. Iran fought Iraq for eight years. It lost hundreds of thousands of people. The war was harsh, the timetable, the, the resources, the, the victims, and always the question was what happened to Khomeini that at a certain point he was ready to go and negotiate about a ceasefire between Iraq and Iran. So there were all sorts of arguments that they started attacking with missiles, Tehran and other cities, and that's what influenced him. But I think what influenced him was the feeling of Khomeini, especially uh, backed by Rafa Rajani, who clarified to Khomeini that if the war goes on and the 
cost of the price, uh, the economic uh, prices and the loss of human lives are such that the regime is losing the support of the people and that there's a very major challenge to the even the survival of the regime. And I think that's what motivated Khomeini to do something that was against his own world view, to go and sign a ceasefire with Saddam Hussein. And that's why a threat on the regime is the most cardinal and the most important threat that you can threaten Iran. So ask me who, but uh, not necessarily, because if the regime changes, and then they'll uh, reject the whole idea of the bomb. I agree. It doesn't, not sure, but if it will be more rational and more moderate, and uh, will take it, uh, into consideration all the constraints, uh, maybe it will have to retest the price says it's willing to pay. And I think that the covert war is very, very important. I think that uh, prevention of proliferation is uh, good, although Iran is becoming more and more independent in all its components of the project. Still, it depends on uh, materials and resources that come from the outside and an international effective action in order to uh, stop and to limit the proliferation in Iran, especially with the technology that it has, uh, can, they can use for the project and other things as well. Uh, that could work. And I would add to this strategy also taking advantage of opportunities. This is part of a worldview that always deals with policy. I think that in this point of time, there's an exceptional opportunity to weaken the position of Iran in the world and in the area. Iran today puts everything into Syria and Hezbollah as a proxy, as tools that they can use against the State of Israel and against the West. I think that at this point of time, in order to convey a message and at the same time to reduce the level of impact of Iran in the area, is by causing a reality that Bashar Assad fa falls and the Sunnis uh, rise and that automatically will weaken the Hezbollah in a dramatic way and it may even take Lebanon a little bit out of that reality which is so complex it's in and I think that the costs and the legitimacy of such an action are much wider today than they were ever in the past and there's no question that such a reality creates a constraint on the capability of Iran to act and to use the tools uh, indirect tools against Israeli targets and uh, American interests. I think that the legitimacy to this possibility is almost ready. I think today nobody has any doubt that uh, Assad staying in power with uh, Iranian uh, uh, backing is any problem uh, to the Iranians or a threat to them. And the last point, I don't think that a military option has to be taken off the table. I think that such an option should be considered very seriously. And the fact that you wave around with it or use it as uh, some sort of a deterrent, in my feeling, it does not deter the Iranians. On the contrary, certain points, it's even a response to Iranian ambitions. If anybody attacks today their nuclear project, especially due to the fact that the capability to stop the project with the military attack, I think at this time, is very, very limited. Thank you.